Reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20, uh, a passage I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. Paul writes, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. With our four grandchildren visiting this weekend, Kim and I have been straining our memories for the the games and the songs and the stories that appeal to preschoolers, that, that appeal to our children when they were that age. I'm sure most of you remember fairy tales as exciting little stories that sometimes carry a lesson for life. In the story of the three little pigs, we find a lesson about how to succeed in life. You probably remember the first two piglets were rather lazy. They took the easy way out. They built homes from straw and from sticks that made them easy prey for the big bad wolf. But the third little pig took the time and worked hard to construct a proper house made of bricks that the wolf couldn't huff and puff and blow down. And so the story teaches, work hard, do it right, and you will be safe. There is truth in that story, but real life is more complicated, isn't it? A man I knew many years ago owned a machine shop. He, he worked very hard and was diligent, and eventually it was successful till the day came when his bookkeeper cleaned out his accounts and disappeared. In other words, life gets complicated, and hard work alone might not be enough. So, in the story of Little Red Riding Hood, she goes to visit her dearly beloved grandmother, not knowing, not realizing that a big wolf had taken her grandmother's place. And it seems to take Little Red Riding Hood an awful long time to realize that something is amiss here. She says, my, what big eyes you have, grandmother. All the better to see you with, my dear. And what big teeth you have, grandmother. And all the better to eat you with, you know. Uh, So, learning that things are not always as they appear is also an important lesson. All that glitters is not gold, we we sometimes say. Now, Now, many of us began our Christian journey as children attending Sunday school. And for the most part, we learned very simple little stories that were appropriate to our age. Things like, God is love, and God loves us. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd, and will watch over us just as a shepherd watches over the flock of sheep. We are safe. God will direct and, 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 and care for us. And we learned about the Good Samaritan who was kind and stopped to help someone who needed help. We learned we should be obedient to our parents. And we, we learned that Jesus healed people who were sick. Sunday school and its simple lessons helped to lay the foundation for us to become adults who were compassionate and moral and concerned for one another. The lessons we learned back in Sunday school were true, 
But sometimes life is more complicated than the simple lessons that we learned. For example, about 500 years ago, the, the country of Portugal was a maritime superpower. Under the influence of Henry the Navigator, Portuguese sailors had sailed to places that no one had ever been before. The coast of Africa was their swimming pool, you might say. And they pushed on to set up trading posts in India and trade routes even to the South China Sea and under a treaty with, with the, the Spanish, Brazil was also theirs. Portugal was a wealthy, a powerful, and an influential state. And it was also a Christian state. They knew that they had been richly blessed by God and as an expression of their gratitude and piety, they built massive stone churches throughout their capital city of Lisbon. Giant stones were hoisted into the sky, creating epic cathedrals. Beautiful stone spires filled the skyline of the city like fingers pointing to heaven. God was good, and God had been very good to them. Then, on the important holy day of, of All Saints' Day, in the year 1755, when the churches were packed with the faithful attending Mass, about 9.45 in the morning, things began to shake and, and, and tremble, and, and the shaking grew violent and, 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 and worse and, and lasted more than five minutes. Giant stones came raining down upon them. Walls gave way. Buildings were collapsing. Thousands were killed and injured. In that day, of course, candles were a primary a light source in the churches and in the homes, and toppling candlesticks soon ignited damaged structures. And fanned by strong winds, a firestorm erupted that burned for six days. With stone buildings collapsing and wild firestorms raging around them, the panicked crowds ran down to the harbor for safety, get away from the big buildings, get down where there is water. But at the water's edge, they were greeted by a very strange sight. The water in the harbor was receding. It was lower than it had ever been before and was still dropping. They'd never seen anything like it. And then, 40 minutes after the earthquake, the giant tsunami hit. And after the earthquake and the fire and the tsunami, there really wasn't very much left of the city. 85% of the buildings had been destroyed, in, in, including 32 churches and 60 chapels, along with the palace and the library and the hospital that had burned down with its patients. Tens of thousands of people had been killed. Some say as many as 50, 60, or 70,000. In fact, there were so many bodies, they had to just load them onto barges and take them out to sea and, and dump them. And it didn't take much time at all before people began asking, if God is loving, if God is all-powerful, how could this terrible disaster have happened? I mean, it made no sense. Was this really the best of all possible worlds? Hadn't they been taught that if they were God-fearing churchgoers, that God would hear their prayers and protect them from disasters like this? Now, perhaps, some of you have had this sort of experience in your life, where you look to heaven through your tear-stained eyes and you say, God, are you really up there? Do you see what is happening? 
Do you care about your children? A fellow I know, a Christian, served in Iraq and came back changed. He said, no, I, I can't believe in a good God. I can't believe in a loving God after all the stuff I've seen and been through. Those experiences change a person. Those experiences can be so hard to, to struggle for. Of course, we are all earthlings. We are people of the earth. And, and there are times when the earth itself is a very dangerous place to live. We watch with concern as storm after storm hits the Gulf Coast. We follow the news of the wildfires in California and the extreme heat in the Southwest. And we live on a planet where viruses and diseases and disasters strike down the just as well as the unjust. And it's always been that way. Even in New Testament times, Mount Vesuvius erupted, burying the city of Pompeii. Actually, the Lisbon tragedy is not inconsistent with the stories that we find in the Bible. In the Gospels, we, we read of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, being imprisoned and eventually beheaded. Three times in Mark's Gospel, we read of Jesus warning his disciples ahead of time that he was going to be betrayed, he was going to be tortured, he was going to be executed. And then Jesus looked farther into the lifetime of his disciples and he warned them of the coming war with Rome when perhaps as many as a million of their countrymen would be killed and the walled city of Jerusalem would become a death trap for those who sought shelter there. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, deliver us from evil. We all prayed the Lord's Prayer this morning. And when I pray those words, <clears throat> I'm usually thinking of external things over which I have no control. Lord, deliver me from aircraft that might fly into the building, or, or the drunk driver, or, or someone with road rage who wants to pepper my car with, 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 with slugs. But in the Testament of, of, of the New Testament, we find Jesus being repeatedly tested by Satan. And sometimes that meant facing the temptation to put his own desires first rather than God's desires. Hmm. Maybe I need to spend less time thinking about the evil out there and more time considering how am I succumbing to evil? What compromises am I making that are affecting my spiritual life? One of our local hometown heroes was John Townsend. Uh, he was born in 1809. He grew up near Westchester. He went to the schools at, uh, at Westtown. He became an accomplished naturalist. As a young man, he was invited to join an expedition exploring the Rocky Mountains. Wow, what a treat. Being one of the first people, one of the first scientists to go and explore that part of the country. He must have felt like, like Adam going through the garden, giving names to all the yet unknown birds and animals of the region. What a wonderful life surrounded by clean air and fresh water and having lots of exercise. Yet he died at the age of 41. He had unwittingly poisoned himself. You see, in order to preserve the, the pelts of the animals and the skins of the birds that he, that he collected, he, he cleaned them out thoroughly and rubbed them with salt 
and dusted them with arsenic. Just, just a little bit, didn't take very much, just a little bit of dust. Harmless, he felt fine. But day after day after day, it continued. Day after day, he grew weaker, exposing himself to this substance that would take his life. When we pray, deliver us from evil, perhaps we need to consider the ways that we might be poisoning our spiritual lives. What is the influence of, of the television shows or the movies we watch? Perhaps we need to pray that God will help us to, to recognize evil when we are exposed to it rather than being, being influenced by its example. Well, we could go on and on and on and on about the evil in this world. Sometimes, though, as Christians, we hang on to our simple Sunday school notions, and, and, and it causes problems as we compare what we think we believe with the reality. The, the, the life that we see is so much more complicated than, than, than we may have been led to believe. Another simple lesson comes from the book of Proverbs. Train up your child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Again, I'm sure much of that is true. But again, it's not always true. Life is more complicated and unpredictable than that. Jack and Joanne lived in Evergreen, Colorado. And these were people who were passionate about their Christian faith. They were evangelical. They believed in the power of prayer. They hosted regular Bible studies in their home. But sadly, their third child, John, developed schizophrenia. He became fixated on an actress he had seen in a movie. And eventually, he believed the delusion that he could impress her. And so he stood outside the entrance of the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C., and shot four people, including Ronald Reagan. Some evil comes from the earth just by living here on this planet. There are bad things that happen. Some evil comes from people choosing to do evil things. Some evil comes from our own hearts when we slip up or make bad choices or, or lose our temper. And while we know that God loves us and forgives us, there is still so much that is mysterious and which defies simple little answers. It's easy to take the part of the, the story that we understand and say, well, that's it, I've got it. But we read in Isaiah, my, my ways are, are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than yours. And you know, perhaps there is no other topic that comes up in the church year that I feel so inadequate to talk about as the undeniable presence of evil in this world. Fortunately, God does not require that we understand, but rather that we trust. God knows the evil of this world. On Good Friday, his own son was nailed to a cross and executed. God knows the pain we feel as evil in the form of crime or disease or disaster strikes down the people we love. And I believe God grieves with us at those times. But God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear 
though the earth should change, though the mountains shake into the heart of the seas, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble, my hope is built on nothing less than God's love, God's faithfulness. Amen.